That's great. How beautiful. Well, it's great to be with you this morning. If you haven't guessed yet already, Eric and Gio are not here today. They are getting a little bit of R&R, and uh, I'm really glad that they're able to do that. My name is John Hopper, and I work for Search Ministries, not Church Ministries, but Search Ministries. And there is a search in Houston that that really helps with the homeless, and I'm not with that search ministries. What I do with search ministries is is I gather people in all kinds of places, in homes and in uh, uh, clubs, in, in businesses, to give them a chance to kick the tires of Christianity, to ask the different questions that they have, uh, to explore, to see whether it's something that uh, fits that makes sense of the world uh, for them. And so you can see how what I do fits in with what Eric and Gio are doing here at the story. And so it's great to be with you uh, today. So let me pray and then I'll share uh, a few thoughts with you today. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this uh, opportunity to gather today and hopefully, Lord, to be reminded of things that you say are true. And so often during our weeks and our days, we are being fed all kinds of things that aren't true. And I pray, Lord, that today that you would bring us back to your measuring stick, Lord, to your road, to your way, Lord. So make that clear for us and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, in the gatherings that I put together, oftentimes there's food involved. People like to gather around food, right? So just before Christmas, I put together this lunch. It was a lunch uh, uh, from people from a particular business in the Post Oak area. And I led a discussion at this lunch. And, and the lunch had a lot to do with Christmas because it was Christmas time. I asked questions like, what do you like about Christmas and don't like about Christmas? What makes a good Christmas gift? What would you change about Christmas? And then I ended with this question. What do you think the meaning of Christmas is? And there were people there who were Christians and people there who weren't. And it was very interesting to hear the meaning that people gave to Christmas. Now, there was one man who was there as a part of this lunch who was very engaged in the conversation, not by the things he said, but by the way he was listening. He was leaning in the whole time. In fact, there were some times when I thought he was about to cry, he was tearing up. So after the lunch, I asked him if he would be interested in going to breakfast, and he jumped at it. So a couple weeks later, we had worked out our schedules. We were able to meet for breakfast, and I knew nothing of this fellow. So I didn't invite him to the lunch. Someone else had invited him to the lunch. And so I figured that at this breakfast, we would just get to know one another, that he would you know, tell me his story. He'd get to know a little bit of mine, and that would really be the extent of at least this first breakfast. But within about the first five minutes, he said this. He said, Four years ago, my brother was changing a tire on the side of the road and someone came by and didn't give him enough clearance and hit him and killed him on the spot. Now, usually I need coffee for an early morning breakfast meeting (laughs) to keep me awake. I didn't need any more coffee for that breakfast. This man said, since that time, I really haven't had any interest in God. It just seems so unfair. Now, a couple of years ago, some friends of ours, they're the Adams, so they're the Adams family. <laughs> they had a son, 19 years old, named Hudson. Hudson was uh, counseling at a camp a couple of hours away from Houston here. And he was involved with different water activities. And he contracted, he didn't know this at first, a brain-eating amoeba. So he thought he had the flu. Those were the symptoms, it seemed like, at first. But within about 72 hours, he had passed away. So here's a young man who's doing good. He's doing great things. He's on the right path. He's having lots of influence on people. And yet, there his life is gone. And as you can imagine, the pain for the family. How is that fair? This last week, my, my wife and I, we 
heard news, as much of the tennis world, we're very connected in the tennis world, and, and uh, we heard news of, of Ken Flack. And, and uh, in our sort of more plain days in the 1980s, Ken Flack was the number one doubles player in the world. He won a number of grand slams. He won the Olympic gold medal. Uh, he's just a couple years older than, than I am. He has four kids. He, he remarried just in the last decade. He has four stepchildren as well. He was very healthy 10 days ago. And we started getting Facebook messages. Pray for, for Ken. He's, he's, he's suddenly gotten very sick. He got bronchitis that went to pneumonia that ended up in septic shock, and he died this last Monday completely healthy 10 days ago. It seems so unfair. Now, this is a pretty somber way to start a sermon. In fact, when I was preparing for today, I go, John, you can't start like this. I mean, you got to be a little more lighthearted at first. People don't really know you. That's, you know, you got to sort of ease into it. And, and yet, as I reflected on it, I thought, you know, but that's not life always. Life doesn't always give us a warm-up, does it? It doesn't always begin lighthearted. In the middle of the night, we get the phone call that, that we, we wish we'd never get. We, we think a day is going to be good. We think a vacation is going to be good. And then tragedy hits. This is the life that we live. So what do you do with that kind of mayhem? What's your response? If you're like most people, you say, what's going on here? This isn't right. It's not fair. Where is God in this? And frankly, it doesn't take dramatic things like that for us to get thinking that way. If you look at the trajectory of your life, you look at the history of your life, you can probably point back to places where you felt you didn't really get the good end of the stick. You wanted to get on the middle school team. You felt you were at least as good as everybody else trying out for the team, and you don't make it. It seems so unfair. You work in high school because you've got this school, this college you want to get into, a school of your dreams, and then you don't get in, and you look at some of the others, and you say, well, my test scores are better than theirs. How did they get in? It seems so unfair. You get a job, and, and, and you seem just as smart and hardworking as your friends, and yet they're posting on Facebook, you know, their third great vacation of the year. And you can't get away for one. You think, this isn't right. This isn't fair. And that promotion, why didn't I get it? And you have this sneaking suspicions because of your age or because of your gender or because of your race. You say, this is not fair. The baby you have in your womb doesn't live. You can't have a baby. You can't even have a, find a mate to have a baby with. You're driving along a road in Florida, as some did this week, and a bridge falls on top of you. All around us, life seems so unfair. And it seems to me that at times like this, Christianity can seem horribly irrelevant. And I feel like it, it, it comes across that way to many people because the view, the perception that people have of Christianity is that it's, it's sort of Pollyannic. Little girl Pollyanna who's exuberantly optimistic, everything will work out so great. So Christianity, it's a be happy, you know, don't worry sort of religion. If you just have enough faith, everything will turn out all right. And even if it doesn't, you can smile your way through it. God loves you, be happy, no worries. <laughs> and for many, that's the picture of Christianity. And so these things happen, and it seems terribly irrelevant. But let me tell you something about the Bible that I, I really appreciate. I feel like it's, it's in touch with reality. It doesn't hide the nitty-gritty of life. So if you think about the Bible and the stories in it, and we'll just look at the stories in Genesis for a moment here. There's all kinds of injustices there. So Adam and Eve, they have two children, two sons to start with. It's Cain and Abel. And they both offer offerings to God. But God only accepts Abel's, not Cain's. Cain thinks that's unfair. So he kills Abel. Now Abel gave the right offering to God, but there he is dead. Now that seems unfair. 
You go forward a, a few chapters, and here's Abraham and, and, and Sarah. And they're older, and God says to them, I'm going to give you a, a child. Really? We're, we're pretty old. I don't know how that's going to work out. Then many years go by. There's still no child. So Sarah says to Abraham, maybe we need to help God out a little bit. So why don't you sleep with my maidservant, Hagar, and have a, a child so we can have sort of a legacy going forward? So Abraham says, okay, I'll do that. And there's a child that's born. And the moment Hagar has her son, Sarah hates her and the child. Now, wait a second. Hagar did just what she was supposed to do, right? And yet she is pushed out of the community and into the wilderness. That seems so unfair. Go a little bit forward. Abraham's grandson, Jacob. Jacob had a brother named Esau. But Jacob wanted the blessing from his father. He wanted to take it away from Esau. Isaac, his father, was old and was blind, and so Jacob deceived him. Made it look like he was Esau when he wasn't, and got his father's blessing, and indeed in his life he would be greatly blessed. How's that fair? This lie, this cheat, this deceit, and he's blessed anyway. And then his son Joseph, sold into slavery by his brothers for nothing in particular. They didn't like him. He happened to be daddy's favorite, but that wasn't his fault. And then once he's a slave, he, he kind of works his way up as a slave. But then he's accused of rape unjustly, thrown into prison. And once he's in prison, he then helps out a couple of other prisoners, and they <laughs> don't remember him when they get out. You see, that's just the book of Genesis. And justice is all over the place. There's even books pretty much dedicated to it. The book of Job's that way. The book of Habakkuk's that way. You see, the Bible doesn't take the injustices and the hard things and the sufferings of the world and just shove it under the carpet as if it doesn't exist. And so maybe the Bible's a lot more relevant than we give it credit for. Now, in a little bit, we're going to dive into the book of Ezekiel. That's what Eric and Gio have been taking us through. But before we do that, I want to address a thought, a statement that gets made to me fairly often in my conversations that I have with people. They say, you know, if there's a God out there and he allows this kind of injustice to go on, then I want Nothing to do with him. In fact, I don't believe in him. I don't think he exists. Now here's where I think that thought or line of thinking falls short. Just a few months ago, I met with a, a young man who had questions. In fact, this was the question he had. He said, how can there be a God if there's all of this evil and suffering? Pretty commendable. He's only about 13 years of age. He's wrestling with that question. He didn't like what he saw in the world, so he said, well, there must not be a God. So I asked him this question. I said, so what's your least favorite color? And he stopped and thought about it, and he said, well, cute green. <laughs> he had a little wry smile on his face as he said it. So that's, that's a pretty good least favorite color, I said. I said, but let's suppose that God showed up today right in front of you and lo and behold, his color was puke green. <laughs> I said, now you might look at God and you might say, ooh, you don't, I don't like the way God looks. He's, he's, he's puke green. But you wouldn't say that he doesn't exist. In fact, you'd even be more convinced of it, because there he is before you. I went on and said, you know, there are lots of rulers in the world that do things that we don't like, that we don't agree with, that have policies that we don't like, that, that, that treat their people in a way that we don't treat, that allow things to go on in their kingdom or their country that we don't like. But that doesn't mean that we then say that they don't exist. Now, we might struggle with the things that are in the world, and we might even struggle this with whether God exists or not, but to go from, I don't like what we see in the world, 
to saying that God doesn't exist, I think that's a logical misstep there. Now let me share with you something else about the Bible and what it says about evil and suffering and injustice. I think this is important to know. The Bible tells us some general reasons why there is evil and suffering in the world. And at tonight's service where there's time for question and answers, maybe we can delve into that a little bit. But most of the time, the Bible doesn't give specific reasons. So even when we see injustices occurring in the Bible, there's not always times where God says, it happened because of this. It does that sometimes, but not always. And rarely in our lives do we get this message from God that says, the reason why this happened in your life, why this person was taken, why you didn't get this job, why that didn't happen was because of this. We don't get the specific information. And as a result, there's a good chance that we will go to our grave wondering why. Even thinking, I don't see how God could bring anything good out of this. Why he would allow this to happen? It just seems so unfair. And you know what? I think God gets that. Because he knows that we don't have all the information. So I worked as a pastor. I was a pastor, served at a church for 16 years before I went on staff with Search Ministries. And I had to make decisions at this church. I had to decide who was a part of different ministry teams, who was on staff, who was not on staff. And sometimes I had to make decisions with information that people in general did not have. I knew things about people. I knew things ab about their character, about the things they had done or hadn't done in the past. And as a result, I was making decisions based on information others couldn't see. And even at times, I knew that when I made a decision, other people would be shaking their heads and saying, why did he do that? That seems so unfair or not right. <laughs> but I wasn't free to give them that information. And so I thank God, too. He understands. He understands when, when we get to that place and say, this just doesn't seem fair, it doesn't seem right. He gets that because he knows we don't have all the information. But, you know, while we might go to our grave wondering how, you know, this could possibly be fair, these things in our lives could be fair, there's one thing that we do not want to go to our grave saying unfair, unfair about. And now I want to turn to Ezekiel so we can see that. So we're going to look in Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33. So you've got your Bible. If you've got one, go ahead and pull it out. If you don't happen to have a Bible, I, I know they've got some in the back, and you can pick one up on the way out. You can even walk up right now and get one if you'd like to. They'll be on the screen, the verses that we'll look at today, but um, just know that. We're glad to give you a Bible here at the story. We're going to look at Ezekiel 33, beginning in verse 12. I'm going to read to verse 20. It goes like this. Therefore, son of man, say to your countrymen. So this is God speaking to Ezekiel. This is what I want you to say to the people. The righteousness of the righteous man will not save him when he disobeys. And the wicked man will not cause and the wickedness of the wicked man will not cause him to fall when he turns from it. Well, that's interesting. The righteous man, if he sins, will not be allowed to live because of his former righteousness. If I tell the righteous man that he will surely live, but then he trusts in his own righteousness and does evil, none of the righteous things he has done will be remembered. He will die for the evil he has done. And if I say to the wicked man, you will surely die, but he then turns away from his sin and does what is just and right, if he gives back what he took in pledge for a loan, returns what he has stolen, follows the decrees that give life, and does no evil, he will surely live, he will not die. None of the sins he has committed will be remembered against him. He has done what is just and right, and he will surely live. And then the passage ends in this way. God says, yet your countrymen say this. 
the way of the Lord is not just. And God says, but it is their way that is not just. If a righteous man turns from his righteousness and does evil, he will die for it. And if a wicked man turns away from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he will live by doing so. Yet, O house of Israel, you say, the way of the Lord is not just, but I will judge each of you according to his own ways. So what do we see there in that passage? It seems to me that we see this. God is saying that there's going to be some people when it's all said and done that are going to be in with God. And there's going to be people when it's all said and done that are going to be out with God. And it's not going to necessarily be who you think it is. In fact, there's going to be some people that seem to have lived very good lives that are on the out. And there's going to be people who, who live some very wicked lives that are going to be on the in. <laughs> and we might even say, even as the Israelites did, well, that's not fair. About a year ago, I was sitting down uh, for lunch with a fellow, and he had recently had heart problems. In fact, he had had surgery and I asked him if it had scared him. He said, oh, yes. Now, I knew from previous conversations that he believed in God. And so I said, so, so if you happen to have died, do you feel like you've been okay with God? He said, yeah, I, I think so. I said, well, tell me a little bit more. I mean, if you were standing before God and, and God said, you know, why should I let you enjoy life with me forever? What, what would you say? And he said, well, I think life is like a scale. And, you know, you've got good things and you've got bad things. And you just got to end up with some more good things and bad things. And, and, uh, and if you've done some really bad things, then you need to do some extra good things. Because, you know, everything's kind of got a point value to it. So you do a negative five thing and you might have to do, you know, six positive one things to get over on the positive side of the ledger. You see, he saw it as a ledger game. And yet what we see here in Ezekiel is it doesn't work that way. It's not just about getting in the black. It's not that way at all. Just take a look back at, with me at a couple verses here. Because I want you to see the difference between the two men, the one who had lived righteously in the beginning, the other who was wicked. The righteous man, remember he had lived righteously for a long time, done lots of good things. But then he turns to a, some sin in the end. But what's really good for us to see here is the reason why he did that. It says he did that because he trusted in his own righteousness. He said, well, I got this covered. <laughs> you know, I've done all this good stuff over here on this side of the scale. So if I dabble in a little sin over here, I'll be okay. I've got, I, I've got this. <laughs> and God says, oh no. No, you don't. The second man, wicked life. He's piled up all kinds of things on this side of the scale and when God comes to him, in verse 14, and says, you're going to die, he says, oh no, I better get my eyes off myself, and I better turn my eyes to God, because if I don't do this, I won't make it. Do you see the difference between the two? The first man is resting on what he brings to the table, that he's got enough good stuff, that his righteousness will earn him the right to get in. The second man knows he doesn't have a chance in the world. And he's the one that is made right before God. So there's one parable that I like to share with people more than any other parable. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's found in Luke chapter 18. And I remember one particular incident when I shared this. It was a few years ago, three or four years ago. It was a friend of mine who I shared it with. He was dying. He had lived a, a life that, that was good in many ways. He had helped many people, but he was an alcoholic too. And, 
It had ripped him up inside. So he lay in a hospital bed. Just his last few days, I went to visit him. And I said, Cliff, can I, can I share a story with you? I said, it's a story that Jesus shared. And it's about two men. See, Jesus said that two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a religious leader. And the religious leader, he went to the temple and looked up to heaven and said, God, thank you that I am not like all the other men, all the other sinners, the evildoers, the robbers, adulterers. I give a tenth of all I get. I fast twice a week. Look at the good that I've done. And then Jesus said, there was a second man, a tax collector, a cheat, a traitor. And he went to the temple to pray. And we see in the biblical text that Jesus says the man stood at a distance. And he beat his chest. And he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, it's the second man, not the first that went right, went home right before God. And so I said, Cliff, if you will just say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner, and cry out to him, he will take you home. Now notice what I didn't say to Cliff. I didn't say, Cliff, have, have you got your records in order? Is your resume all cleaned up? So that when you're in that line before the pearly gates, not that it necessarily really exists, and you're waiting to see God, to see whether God will let you in, you can whip out your resume and tell him all the good things you did. I didn't tell him that because it's not the way it works. And that's what Ezekiel is telling us in this passage, that it's not a ledger game like that. Now, this is hard for some people to swallow. It was hard for the people of Ezekiel's day. Because most people today, they've, they've bought into this line of thinking. In fact, if you talk to people, this is really their worldview. It goes like this. There's a God or supreme being out there. Most people in Houston believe that. They might describe it differently than we would, but they believe there's some supreme being out there. Secondly, they believe that there's something after this life, or at least they hope so. So you go to a funeral of somebody that wasn't religious at all, and people are talking about he's in a better place, she's in heaven gardening, he's playing golf, because people want to believe that there's something after this life. And then third, they believe that the way you enjoy that life is by being a good person now. And if you're good enough, you get to enjoy that. And it's a funny thing. Almost everyone thinks they're good enough. So people are relying on this good works kind of system. But you know, that system isn't all it's drummed up to be. <laughs> Think about it. First of all, oftentimes people think that, yeah, I just need to do one more good thing than bad and I'm in. But how many courses have you passed by just getting one more right answer than wrong answer on a test? I mean, why isn't it 75% you need? I mean, that's what you need for a driver's license, right? You got to get 75%. And why isn't it 85 or 95%? And then think of this. What if we aren't just counting the things that we did bad, but we're counting the things that we didn't do that were good. No one ever thinks of that in their ledger game. The times they're sitting on the couch and wife wants you to, you know, empty the dishwasher, but you just stay there sitting on the couch. How many of there are those, those things? We added those in. And, you know, we never count the little things that we do against us, Right? So we say, well, I'm okay, I never murdered anybody. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you didn't murder anybody. But look at all these little things that you didn't count on your ledger. And then how about this? Did you add thoughts in? The Bible says we have to add thoughts in, that God judges our thoughts and intentions as well. How are you feeling in the ledger game then? 
You know, I'm convinced that I don't have a snowball's chance in hell of being right before God if I take my list of goods and bads. In fact, if you were to project just what I've said and done in, say, the last month on these walls right here, I wouldn't be standing in front of you. I would be hiding somewhere. I would find some deserted island. And if I wouldn't be willing to stand before you with all that, all of my thoughts, intentions, things I didn't do that I should do, all the ways that, that I've done wrong, if I wouldn't be willing to stand before you, what makes me think I'd be willing to stand before God with that? You see, God's justice and his way it's so much better than our way. I want you to look back in verse 11. It's a verse we didn't read earlier. But I love what it says about God's heart. It says this, say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn. Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? Do you see God's heart here? He doesn't desire to leave anybody on the out. He doesn't look, oh man, what a wicked life that person's lived. They're not in. I would never want them to be here. No, his heart is that all would return to him. And he knows we can't make it based on our own righteousness. And so he says, here's what you need to do. Turn from you thinking that your righteousness will be good enough and turn to me knowing that it's only in looking at me that you will be right before God. So I started today by talking about the injustices in the world. The injustices around me, injustices around you, and it might have stoked even some memories within you. And there's a chance, I said, that, that you'll even go to your grave wondering why that happened. That seems so unfair. And as I said, I think God gets that. But there's one thing you don't want to go to your grave saying unfair, unfair about. And that's about the way that God will judge us. And it won't be based on our righteousness, on our goodness, on the things we bring to the table, on our resume. It will be based on his and whether we're willing to turn our face towards him. So that's the question, really. Have we done that? That's the question for all of the humanity in all ages. That's the question for you and me today. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for your word, for your clarity that you bring. And, and Lord, to, to be honest, we, we often do try to stack ourselves up so I'm pretty good. I, I got this taken care of. And yet, Lord, you know we don't see things clearly. And you bring that out for us, Lord. And we're so thankful for that. Lord, turn our faces towards you. Get them off of our own righteousness and onto you, Lord. And we thank you for the life that you offer in that. In Christ's name, amen. Well, the story, we offer communion each week. It's a time for us really to say thank you. To say thank you for what Christ has offered on our behalf. So we don't have the righteousness to stand before God, but Christ does. And he lets us ride his coattails. Isn't that cool? And so each week we gather together to, to break the bread, to remember that Christ's body was broken for us, and to drink of the cup to remember that Christ's blood was shed 
for us. And so we offer this communion to all today, hoping that you will take it in remembrance of the great gift that Christ has offered you. So there are stations around the room where you can go, you can stand and and take communion this morning. If you uh, have food allergies and you need a a gluten bread or gluten-free bread, it's in the back and you can take of that. So let me pray and then you can go and take communion. So Lord, we thank you for your life. We thank you for the justice that you afford. We thank you for the life that you offer us into the future, Lord. To be honest, without that life, the injustices of this world will never be right. But you do offer that life. And you offered it beginning with the crucifixion, resurrection of your son. And we thank you for that. In Christ's name, amen.